pizza, wings, noodles, hamburgers, corn on the cob, look at all that food. It makes you hungry. Well, you have to eat sometime, so grab a snack and enjoy the topic. We are into the overall theme, human physiology. Topic six, we have ventured away from ecology and evolution and gone straight to humans. Learning about the, how the body works and functions is fascinating. We are complex peeps. Our first topic is all about digestion and the digestive system. How does it work? From the moment that you take a bite of your most favoritist food to the moment it gets digested and the even further moment when it comes out the other end. You might think that for a biology teacher, this is the absolute best time to insert a poop joke, but I resist it. However, I probably should look into sponsors sponsorship for my videos now, like Xlax or Alka-Seltzer or Pepto-Bismol. Our essential idea in 6.1 is the structure of the wall of the small intestine allows it to move, digest, and absorb food. It sounds real simple, but don't hate on me for saying this. This is where the bleep hits the fan. Yep, sorry, that was too easy. Here are a couple of other jokes for you. Maybe you don't know enough yet to fully understand the one on the left, but when you do, it's super corny. All jokes aside, the topic of human physiology is very, very detailed. And yes, you are required to know all these little details. The first thing to know about the human physiology is that there are a lot of diagrams and sketches. You need to know how to accurately draw and annotate, which means label, the digestive system. So let me briefly discuss how the digestive system is laid out. First, the role of the digestive system is to break down and process nutrients so they can be absorbed by the small intestine and utilized to make energy and molecules for the body's cells. We can break up the digestive system into two parts, the alimentary canal and the accessory organs. The alimentary canal consists of organs through which food actually passes, so the esophagus, stomach, small and large intestine, and the accessory organs that aid in digestion but do not actually transfer food, so things like the salivary glands, pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. These make up the digestive system. We will be practicing drawing this and I won't go into detail about the specific functions of the parts right now because you can read them here. Some key things to keep in mind, however, are details for your drawing. The stomach should look like a J-shaped bag and be connected to the esophagus and small intestine. The liver should look like a right-angled triangle and be superimposed to the left of the stomach, so on the right side of the human. The bile duct, which connects to the gallbladder, and pancreatic duct should both feed into a U-shaped bend of the small intestine. The small intestine should be thinner in width than the large intestine. The accuracy does matter. Here is some more detail for you on the small intestine and the large intestine, but you do not need to know how to draw it. The intestines are a long continuous tube running from stomach to the anus where the absorption of nutrients and water occurs. The small intestines absorb nutrients and the large intestines absorb water and mineral ions. The small intestine consists of three distinct parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The large intestine consists of the ascending colon, transverse colon, the descending colon, sigmoidal colon, and the rectum. The appendix is there as well, but remember from topic five that it's a vestigial structure and does not really have a function that we know of. Now that we have covered the anatomy part, let's discuss the process of digestion itself. First, the main purpose of the digestive system is to break large molecules down into smaller subunits due to the fact that they are usable for the human body and they're insoluble and cannot be absorbed. In short, large molecules are useless. It doesn't matter how many hamburguesas y alitas that you consume, unless you break it down, the food is useless. So like MC Hammer said in the song, you can't touch this, break it down. That's what the digestive system does. The process of digestion occurs across five stages, which includes ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation, and elimination. So in ingestion, you're taking the food into your body through the act of eating. Digestion itself, the food is broken down physically and chemically. The absorption part, which happens in the small intestine, is where the products of digested food are absorbed into the bloodstream and get transported around your body. And assimilation is when the digested food products then get converted into the fluid and solid parts of a cell or tissue. It's when your body's actually using them for making its own cells. The last one is elimination, in which undigested food particles get egested from the body as semi-solid feces, which sounds like a really fancy way of saying poop. Digestion itself occurs in two ways mechanical and chemical. Let's look at those processes and how they work. In mechanical digestion, food is physically broken down into smaller fragments via the act of chewing in the mouth, churning in the stomach, and segmentation in the small intestine. Food is initially broken down in the mouth by grinding action of teeth, which is chewing or also known as mastication. The tongue pushes the food toward the back of the throat where it travels down the esophagus as a substance called bolus, 
which is like a ball of chewed up food combined with salivary enzymes. The epiglottis and uvula prevents the bolus from entering the trachea and the nasal cavity. Once the bolus gets to the stomach, the stomach lining contains muscles, which physically squeeze and mix the food with strong digestive juices. So this is the churning. Food is digested within the stomach for several hours and is turned into a creamy paste called chyme. Eventually, the chyme enters the small intestine and the duodenum where absorption of nutrients starts to occur. So how does the food actually move through the digestive system? Easy peasy, through peristalsis and segmentation. You can see them both here in the graphic below. Peristalsis is the principal mechanism of movement in the esophagus, although it also occurs in both the stomach and the gut. In peristalsis, continuous segments of longitudinal smooth muscle rhythmically contract and relax. Food is moved unidirectionally, so in one direction, along the alimentary canal in the caudal direction, which is from the mouth to the anus. Think of trying to put a small ball into a hose and squeezing the hose, which you can see here. On the other hand, Segmentation involves the contraction and relaxation of non-adjacent segments of circular smooth muscle in the intestines. Segmentation contractions move chyme in both directions, allowing for a greater mixing of food with digestive juices. While segmentation helps to physically digest food particles, its bidirectional propulsion, which means it can go in both directions, can actually slow movement overall. This is mechanical digestion. In chemical digestion, food is broken down by the action of chemical agents, such as enzymes, acids, and bile. We gotta talk about these things. The stomach contains gastric glands, which release digestive acids to create a low pH environment, which is somewhere around pH of two. The acidic environment functions to denature proteins and other macromolecules, which aids in their overall digestion. The stomach epithelium, which is the innermost layer of cells, contains a mucous membrane, which prevents the acids from damaging the gastric lining. The pancreas releases alkaline compounds, things like bicarbonate ions, which neutralize the acids as they enter the intestine. So the stomach has a very low pH. The liver produces a fluid called bile, which is stored and concentrated within the gallbladder prior to release into the intestine. Bile contains bile salts, which interact with fat globules and divide them into smaller droplets, and this process is called emulsification. The emulsification of fats increases the total surface area available for enzyme activity, and we will learn later that the enzyme is lipase. The last and really important piece of the chemical digestion are enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts which speed up the rate of a chemical reaction by lowering the energy needed to be activated. Basically, enzymes allow digestive processes to occur at body temperatures and at sufficient speeds for survival requirements. If you didn't have enzymes, we would not exist. Enzymes have specificity, which means they're specific for a substrate, which is the thing they help break down, and so can allow digestion of certain molecules to occur independently in distinct locations. They are like the key to the lock. You can see examples of enzymes from the pancreas and from the liver. Our pancreas makes loads of enzymes. You definitely need to know the four enzymes in the pancreas, what the substrate is, and the product they break the substrate down into. You'll find that most enzymes end with the letters a -S -E. Let's talk a bit more about digestive enzymes. As I said, digestive enzymes are secreted predominantly by the pancreas, although other organs also contribute, like the salivary gland and the stomach. We will look at each of the main types of macromolecules, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and see how they're all broken down. Carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth with the release of amylase from the salivary glands. And amylase, which we'll learn later, looks at the digestion of starch. Amylase is also secreted by the pancreas in order to continue the carbohydrate digestion within the small intestine. So you have salivary amylase and pancreatic amylase. Other enzymes for disaccharide hydrolysis, which is the breaking down of disaccharides, are often found in the epithelial lining of the small intestine, near protein channels. Humans do not possess an enzyme capable of digesting cellulose, and hence it passes through the body undigested as fiber. This is a good thing, as it helps you poop. Protein digestion begins in the stomach with the release of proteases that function optimally in acidic pH, and an example of that is pepsin. Smaller 
polypeptide chains, or long protein chains, enter the small intestine where they get broken down by endopeptidases released by the pancreas. These endopeptidases work optimally in neutral environments like a pH of 7, and the pancreas neutralizes the acids once they get into the intestine. Lipid breakdown also occurs in the intestine, beginning with the emulsification of fat globules by bile released from the gallbladder. The smaller fat droplets are then digested by lipases released from the pancreas. The pancreas also releases nucleases, which digest nucleic acids, so DNA and RNA, into smaller nucleosides. So here, you can see that in chemical digestion, bile, acids, and enzymes all work together. Did you hear about the joke about the small intestine? It was really funny. Let's focus now on the intestine. The inner epithelial lining of the intestine is highly folded into finger-like projections called villi, and the singular is a villus. Many villi will protrude into the intestinal lumen, and you can see the protrusion here, greatly increasing the available surface area for material absorption. Absorption is the process that digested food particles pass between the small intestine and into the bloodstream or lymphatic system. This is how you get all of your nutrients. All of them. Every one of them. And there are some really rad features of the villi that help to facilitate the absorption of all the good stuff. You can remember this by the mnemonic Mr. Slim. All credit goes to BioNinja for that one. So let's go through these one by one. First, there are the microvilli. Think even smaller villi at the end of the villus. These add ruffles to the epithelial membrane and further increases the surface area. Second, the villi contain a rich blood supply, so a dense capillary network which helps to rapidly transport absorbed products into the body. Third, the outer layer of the villus is one cell thick layer epithelium, which minimizes the distance of diffusion between the lumen, which is the, the intestine itself, and the blood. Next, these structures, called lacteals, absorb lipids from the intestine into the lymphatic system and not the bloodstream. Next, intestinal glands also release more digestive juices. The addition of more chemicals helps even more in breaking down molecules. Lastly, membrane proteins facilitate transport of digestive materials into the epithelial cells across the cell membrane. So remember the mnemonic, Mr. Slim. Also, you need to be able to draw and annotate the structures in the villus in addition to knowing the functions. So to recap, they are the capillary, epithelial cell, the lacteal, and the goblet cell. I wanted to give special attention to three terms that you should be able to compare. Digestion, absorption, and assimilation. Digestion is the breakdown of large molecules, so macromolecules, into smaller molecules. Absorption is the uptake of these nutrients and small molecules into the blood and lymph system. Assimilation is the usage of these molecules at their final destination. Good talk. One of the skills that you need to know is to outline the function of the four layers of tissue found in the wall of the small intestine. You can see these layers here from outermost to innermost the serosa, the muscle layer, the submucosa, and the mucosa. You can see the longitudinal direction and the transverse section cuts. You also need to look at and label the four layers of tissue found in the wall of the small intestine as viewed with a microscope or in a micrograph. We will be exploring and practicing this in class. During absorption, the epithelial cells in the villus, so the outermost cells, use different methods to move molecules into the villus and out of the lumen of the intestine. Remember that the macromolecules, so the sugars, proteins, and lipids, are not all the same, and so different processes are needed. We will discuss them further, but to list them here, they are co-transport, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and simple diffusion. When we talk specifically about the absorption of triglycerides into the lacteals, which is part of the fats, the process of diffusion occurs. When it comes to glucose, it is facilitated diffusion. Let's chat a bit more about how processes in the small intestine help to digest starch and transport it to the liver for storage as glycogen. Starch itself is a very long chain polysaccharide composed of glucose monomers and accounts for roughly 60% of the carbohydrates consumed by humans. And usually this is in two forms, amylose or amylopectin. Digestion of starch begins in the mouth with salivary amylase and continues in the intestine with pancreatic amylase. Amylase, which you should remember is an enzyme, cannot function at low pH level in the stomach, and so it doesn't work there. Amylase breaks polysaccharides down into disaccharides, so two monosaccharides. Amylose and amylopectin get broken down into slightly different forms of the same sugar, maltose and dextrin. Other enzymes, like sucrase, 
maltase, and lactase break down disaccharides into monosaccharides, mainly glucose. Glucose then gets transported by epithelial cells through facilitated diffusion, where it can be transported and used in hydrolysis to make ATP, which as you know, is energy. When glucose is plentiful, it can also be put back into larger molecules called glycogen and then stored in the liver. This has many implications for the topic of nutrition and ties to tissues related to the accessory organs of the pancreas and the liver, as well as the endocrine system, which has to do with hormones like insulin and glucagon, which we will discuss later in topic 6.6. .6. In summary, most food is solid and in the form of large complex molecules, which are insoluble and chemically inert, so it's not readily usable. One application of this topic is to model digestion using visking tubing, which is also called dialysis tubing. As you know, a core function of the di digestive system is to break down large molecules into smaller subunits that can be absorbed by cells. Cell membranes, like epithelial cells, are impermeable to large molecules, like polysaccharides or polypeptides, unless transport is facilitated by proteins. The size-specific permeability of cell membranes can be modeled using dialysis tubing. And dialysis tubing contains pores ranging from 1 to 10 nanometers in diameter, and it's semi-permeable according to the molecular size. And you can see an example of that in the image here. Large molecules, like starch, cannot pass through the tubing. However, smaller molecules, like maltose, can cross. Unlike the membranes of living cells, dialysis tubing is not selectively permeable based on the charge. Digestive enzymes like amylase can break down impermeable polymers like starch into permeable subunits like maltose. Dialysis tubing is impermeable to amylase and starch, but permeable to maltose and water. So we will conduct a small experiment, and it's important to see how we can model digestion of starches. As you know, modeling is a very important way to study functions in science and math. That's all I've got for you today. Hopefully you finished your pizza or hamburguesa by now, because it's probably cold. My hope is that you're able to digest this material about digestion, absorb it into your brains, and assimilate it and build into useful knowledge for yourself. See what I did there? Ha! As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation script and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not. So shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from IB Bio Ninja and some of the information used. Other images and info come from Bionology, iBiology, and Biology for Life. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the IB Biology Tech, as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum. So, peace out.